guys. Sorry about that. Looks like we had a few little technical errors. No big deal. Um, we Brandon, just had to pay our cox bill. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon and I are still here. We've got a few more minutes to go on our presentation. Uh, we promised you a 30 minute presentation and we're absolutely planning to deliver. So, uh, Brandon, we had left off where you had asked about the difference between green cards and lawful permanent resident cards. Right. Um, did you, you did understand, of course, that they're both the exact same thing. It's just the uh, local lingo or the common lingo of calling it a green card versus the formal way of saying lawful permanent residence. Right. Right? Yeah, because we as lawyers don't like long multiple words. That's exactly right. <laughs> so I guess so here's another question that I'm kind of thinking about because you said that there was a difference between if we were to get married, right? Mm -hmm. Um the difference between certain waiting periods. Um why is there this additional hurdle of waiting periods for marriages that are less than two years? Uh -huh. That's a good question. So the question is, why does a um, marriage that is less than two years going to get a shorter or conditional green card versus a longer marriage, a marriage of over two years, getting a long um, or the full lawful permanent residence card? And the reason is very simple. Um, our federal government has always been concerned about immigration fraud. And so one of the reasons that they create this stopgap measure is to make sure that they have the opportunity to revisit a couple's relationship and confirm that yes, it is still a marriage, that it's still based on, on a desire to be together. Now, that isn't to suggest that there aren't some exceptions, of course. Uh, our government does want to um, give people the opportunity to get out of um, abusive marriages and, and uh, not be subjected to this waiting time. Um, so there are ways to ask for, for what is called a waiver of the joint petition to remove conditions requirement. But under most circumstances, our government wants to see that a, a valid marriage is uh, the reason for which a person is being granted lawful permanent residence. Okay, so how long are lawful permanent residence cards valid? So a, the, as I shared, the conditional resident card is a two-year card, but if you get a long-term card because you are um, either not, it's not based on marriage, so a parent green card, children's green cards, uh, siblings green cards, or the marriage is over two years old, the uh, true duration of a green card is a 10-year card. Okay, and so when your green card expires, you know, I'm thinking of like my driver's license, what happens? <laughs> they can't like suspend your green card, I mean, what happens? <laughs> well, so you always until the until the government decides to um, initiate what's called removal proceedings that's the polite way of saying deportation right, right? Okay. Uh, unless they do that once a green card holder always a green card holder right there are certain things that you can do to have a green card um, taken away from you um, but we're talking about just the mm -hmm. standard, like if my, like you said, if my green card expires, am I no longer a green card holder? No, that's not true. However, the importance of renewing your green card is that uh, employers are not able to hire you if you bring in an expired green card. Therefore, it is crucial to have a green card that is valid, that is unexpired. And one of the other requirements of having uh, a green card is that you are required to carry it with you at all times. So, uh, you know, kind of side topic again. If I and, and did I say that they are valid for a total of 10 years each? So long-term green cards are, ten, are issued 10 years at a time right now. Okay. okay. I apologize. I don't know if I actually said that. Well, and the, the thing <laughs> that I was interested in is, you know, is the process for renewing your green card different? Cool. You know, if my green card is about, you know, I'm on my nine year, right? Mm -hmm. Should this be something that I'm thinking about, you know, year 9.5? Or is this something that I should probably be thinking about, you know, on the ninth year to make sure that it gets processed in enough time or maybe even before that? That's a good question. So by law, immigration will not process a case if the card, uh, the green card is 
less than not nine and a half years. So in other words, if, if year nine comes around and I submit an application to renew my green card, then what's going to happen is that it's going to be denied because it's too early. Okay. Right? Not right, right? Is okay. what lawyers call it. However, um, while the requirements aren't necessarily strict, in other words, unless you've committed a crime or done or um, abandoned residency, meaning you've been living outside of the U.S. longer than you've been inside of the U.S., you should still be eligible for it, and it shouldn't be too much of a difficult process. You have to process application forms, provide evidence that you're um, still doing the right thing, and um, you should be able to get it. The reason that we, as meaning immigration lawyers, typically recommend to people that they start processing or submitting their applications to renew their green cards six months before the expiration is that the process takes a long time, even for somebody who is got no problems on their uh, and no concerns about their green card not being uh, eligible to be renewed. Does that make sense? Yeah, and the second part that I had is so if your 10 year green card expires, is there a way that you become an automatic US citizen? I mean, is it like, you know, you finally pass that hurdle, now I am That's, there? I, I wish it were that easy, okay. um, but it's not. In order to become a US citizen, people always have to apply to a process known as naturalization. Now, luckily, you do not have to wait for a full 10 years before you can uh, start the naturalization process. For example, Brandon, uh, individuals who marry a uh, U.S. citizen and obtain their lawful permanent residence through a marriage have the ability to apply for U.S. citizenship within th uh, three years of uh, getting their green card. So less than 10 years, which is great. Um, individuals who get their green card through a uh, parent or for a parent or a child have to wait a minimum of five years. Uh, and so, again, keeping the time frames in mind, you can start as early as, you know, 90 days before the expiration because it will take time for your naturalization application to be processed. So you had mentioned the minor children. Um, how long do minor children have to wait until they are allowed to become U.S. citizens? Well, if the minor child is a um, minor child of a U.S. citizen, once that child comes into the U.S. with a valid lawful permanent residence card, they are then eligible to apply um, for a certificate of citizenship because uh, parents have the right, automatic right to bestow status uh, U.S. citizenship on their children. Um, now, if the child is over the age of uh, majority, then they must uh, apply for naturalization. Okay. And one of the things that you had talked about earlier was the evidential requirements for um, doing these applications for these processes. Um, what kind of evidential requirements are there? And um, in addition to those, are there any other requirements that we have to go through? So this, that, those are two big questions, Brandon. Okay. Um, the evidentiary requirements will depend on the relationship to the U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident holder. So for example, for parents, um, if it's a birth parent, uh, something as simple as the birth certificate qualifies as uh, proof of the relationship because it will have the parent's name on it, as well as the U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident child's name on it, right? Um, for siblings, you would include uh, birth certificates and of both and parent information of both, right? Uh, for spouses, uh, in addition to birth certificates, because they're always always required, uh, you would need to demonstrate through uh, marriage certificate. Okay. The so when I see you like going around the firm collecting all of these like really essential documents, this is what you're doing. You're assembling these packets in order to be sent to the State Department. Uh, Department of Homeland Security, USCIS, okay. is where you always start the immigration process. Okay. And so, in terms of 
the evidentiary requirements that we've covered and everything else like that, is there anything that you would recommend that we know before we start this process that, you know, could help us in terms of success? Yes, and actually, Brandon, you also had asked another question, which I failed to answer. You had asked what other, in addition to the evidence, what other requirements oh, yes, are yes, yes. And yeah. so let's let's back off to that one yeah. real quick because that's an important question. Uh, in addition to demonstrating the family relationship, the U.S. government expects the U.S. citizen or the lawful permanent resident petitioner to demonstrate that their non-U.S. relative will not become dependent on government assistance. Uh, they uh, do not want people to become what's called a public charge, right? Um, and therefore, petitioners will also need to act as financial sponsors for their non-U.S. relatives. Uh, now, recently, the Trump administration has attempted to change the public charge requirements. But federal judges in three states, uh, New York, California, and Washington, recently mm -hmm. issued temporary injunctions against this administration's uh, new public charge rules. Therefore, the rules which were going to take place starting uh, yesterday are now uh, enjoined and cannot take place. But that doesn't mean that financial sponsorship requirements for immigrants are easy. They're not. Uh, in fact, uh, there are guidelines that a um, U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident will have to meet in order to demonstrate that they make sufficient income or have sufficient assets to uh, bring somebody in and to petition for them. Um, one of the documents that helps people determine whether or not they meet the qualifications is a form on uh, the USCIS's website called the I-864P, also, uh, also known as the HHS Poverty Guidelines for Affidavit of Support or just poverty guidelines, if you type in uh, your favorite browser, poverty guidelines immigration, you'll find it. Look for a number, immigration um, gives number designations to all of their documents, and the number is I-864P. Anyway, so these guidelines require sponsors to demonstrate that their income meets or exceeds a certain amount. The amounts will vary depending on the number of people in the sponsor's household size and the number of people being petitioned. Also, different amounts will um, be imposed, different amount requirements or minimum guidelines will be imposed depending on whether somebody lives within the 48 contiguous U.S. states or Alaska or Hawaii. And all of these numbers are based on the cost of living in each of, the, in each of those states. So it depends on where you are, and then they're going to basically set a sliding scale for you? Essentially, yes. Okay. But the sliding scale is 125% um, above the poverty guidelines, okay? Um, there is one little exception for act, uh, spouses and children of uh, active duty service members. They only need to meet the 100% poverty guideline, uh, or at least meet the top end of what you have to be making to survive in, in the U.S., uh, okay. according to the Health and Human Services Department. So I guess the last thing uh, is what things increase my chances of success in doing uh, any kind of immigration work? What are the things that I should bring to you? What are the things that I should be looking out for or trying to find before I come in to see you or um, that would help me along the way? Well, a lot of times what's going to be important is really the documents that you have. So, for example, for the financial, to demonstrate financial capacity, you're going to have to have copies of three years worth of tax returns. Um, though you do not have to submit all three years to immigration services, uh, you only have to submit the most recent uh, year you will need the information from the three years uh, worth of tax return. So a lot of times, uh, I personally, uh, as an immigration attorney, tend to ask clients to bring the three years with because I do think there's value in that. Uh, so we'll want tax returns, W-2 forms, you'll need employer letters. Uh, and so these things will then help demonstrate that you meet the financial requirements. Uh, likewise, depending on the family relationship, you will need to demonstrate um, the ties in the family. Uh, in a case involving a spouse, uh, one of the things that immigration wants to see is, is documents that demonstrate that this is a true marriage, that there's 
financial entanglements, that there's uh, cohabitation, that there's um, a shared life, essentially, because that is the um, easiest one to, to create a fraudulent case. Immigration wants more evidence, right? I mean, whereas a parent relationship can only be proven by a birth certificate, and if immigration questions that, then their next step is to do a DNA test. Very solid ways to determine whether this is a true relationship or not, right? Right. Um, you can also, of course, use a petition for an adoptive parent, but uh, again, legal documents such as adoption decrees, adoption um, documents from, from a family law court. Whereas the marriage case can um, require more entanglements because these are what immigration considers easier cases to, um, I guess, falsify. Right. I mean, I can go to Las Vegas and get married to somebody right now. Right. But we could get married right now, and then we could begin the immigration process, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the thing that they're trying to stop, which is, okay, we want to make sure that this is a legit marriage. Absolutely. And it is justified, of course, because we want to protect ourselves from people taking advantage of our immigration system. And because uh, it is a um, process when you do a marriage-based case that, that gives people the opportunity to go to, a, to the head of the line, mm -hmm. right? So we don't want to be wasting visa numbers on those uh, cases that are not true in real cases. Like, for instance, over like the sibling cases? Correct. Okay, okay. Correct. So, um, the only other thing that I'll share with you guys for now, I'm so glad that you've taken the time to listen to Brandon and I talk about immigration today, um, but uh, the affidavit of support is an important piece of the puzzle, and if you are interested in learning more about the affidavit of support, our uh, November Immigration Facebook Live program, uh, which is currently scheduled for November 13th at 4.30 p.m., will feature uh, a discussion on affidavit of support, the current affidavit of support, the uh, changes by the administration. Uh, we'll also give a status update on the current litigation involving uh, the administration's attempt to change the public charge requirements. Um, and in, uh, we will uh, also be answering any questions that you have about the affidavit of support. So start sending them to us. DM us. I am us, whatever, Facebook messenger. Slide into those DMs. That's right. Um, carrier pigeon, does that age me? <laughs> no, no. Anyway. So um, also next week, I will be hosting five things that you need to know um, after you get a DUI. Not yeah. a fun time for everybody, but the thing is, is that there are certain things that we can know that help set us up for success in our future. Absolutely. Um, and so I'm really excited to do that one. And Gabrielle and I are going to be together, roles reversed. Absolutely. Um, and, and it's going to be a good time. So I hope that we see you all there. Yes. So check us out next Wednesday, 4.30 p.m. Five things you need to know about uh, DUIs. Same bat time, same bat channel, <laughs> as they used to say. See, yes, I'm my own. aging. <laughs> um, we look forward to talking to you, and please know that if you have additional questions, you can always contact us and schedule a consultation, whether it's for immigration or uh, criminal defense work, like the kind of work that Brandon does, at 785-776-2000. We are so thankful to have your time today, and we look forward to talking to you next week. Absolutely. Bye. Thank you, guys.